Let's take our Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, if you will stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to look at two passages primarily. The messages are not going in, in the route I originally designed them, but that's okay. In fact, that's encouraging because I know that the Holy Spirit is involved with that. Many times a pastor will sit down and he'll see what a verse or a passage, if he's ex preaching expository, says about a thing. And he'll begin to formulate an opinion or a, a, a conclusion and then begin to formulate his sermon. And his conclusion is nothing like that which he sat down at the very beginning. But that's allowing the Lord to take control. Ephesians chapter 4, let's look at verse number 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, he speaks of maturity there when he says perfect. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him and all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for joining us together. Lord, when we, when we consider this local this local church, when we consider how you've sovereignly placed us here together to worship together, to serve together, to uh, be here for one another and encourage and edify one another, we see nothing less than the sovereign hand of God at work placing together various different backgrounds, various personalities, Father, for the perfecting of the saints. May we remember that we are called, we are sanctified, we are placed by your Holy Spirit to be a light to one another, uh, to be a servant to one another and most of all, to bring you through our labor, bring you honor and glory. Father, may we strive to, to, to please you. May we desire nothing less than your glory in everything that we say and do. Father, I pray that you would give me the words to speak. I pray that your words would uh, be, be sounded forth clearly and that they would bring conviction of sin. Father, that they would exhort, reprove, and rebuke if necessary. But Father, I pray that all things be done for your glory. I pray that your spirit would manifest his presence. Be pleased by what is said here today, and it's in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We noted last week the nature and work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is equal in the triune Godhead. He is as much God and as much to be venerated as God as pardon me as and much as much to be venerated as God as the Father and the Son as well he is the agent of God in creation. The spirit of God is active in an indirect way in the world to convince and convict of sin. He puts forth a general call of the gospel of Christ. He strives within the world through his evangelism by by the truth of his creation and by the written word of God. He is responsible for the salvation of the children of God. It is the Holy Spirit who regenerates men. It is the Holy Spirit who illuminates God's Word to men. It is the Holy Spirit who convicts them of sin, who grants them the gifts of faith in Christ and repentance of sin. God's Holy Spirit is the seal of final redemption. We are given the earnest of the Spirit as 1 Corinthians 1.22 states. The word earnest means a pledge. The word means literally the part of the purchase money or property given in advance as security for the rest. This means the Holy Spirit is given unto God's children as the assurance of final redemption. These are just a few of the works of the Holy Spirit, generally convicting and convincing the world of sin, again, by virtue of His evangelists, by virtue of the Word of God in the English language that people can pass through Walmart and look upon 
the bookshelf and see that King James Bible there upon the bookshelf, maybe nod to it or remember some verses they learned in Sunday school once upon a time, that is an acknowledgement of the Holy Spirit's work. There's the Holy Spirit working in this creation. But effectually He works in the lives of God's children when it, in the process of time when God it, it desires for His children to be saved. He sends that Holy Spirit to breathe that pneuma, that breath of life into the dead individual to quicken them unto salvation. And He convicts us. He illuminates His Scripture. We further examine the work of the Spirit by elaborating upon apostolic gifts that were bestowed upon the apostles during the infant years of the New Testament church. We concluded by virtue of Scripture and history that all evidence points to the cessation of this classification of gifts, which would include sign gifts and revelatory gifts. Now that message is online if you missed it. Uh, we're not going to take the time to restate the case already made. Paul's address to the Corinthians in chapters 12 through 14 of his first epistle to them have to do with their misguided priorities in the church. And he uses the gifts of the recently post Pentecost church as an example. Yet we know that there is nothing in Scripture to indicate that those gifts are to still be pursued or that they are granted any following the death of the last apostle. Instead, the New Testament, however, in the books of Galatians, Ephesians, the letters to Timothy, the letters to Paul, uh, the letters of Peter and the letters of James, all seem to emphasize the fruit of the Spirit and the nature of the personal calling that the Spirit produces in the individual that have continued throughout the Scriptures and the history of the Lord's churches. So basically, rather than emphasizing the apostolic sign and revelatory gifts, which were only mentioned in Acts and in, the, in those uh, the, the emphasized there in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, they put more emphasis on the fruit of the Spirit. They put more emphasis on walking in the Spirit on edifying and exhorting and encouraging. A.W. Pink wrote, he said, Just as men have erred grievously concerning the being of God, grossly misrepresenting Him by images, and just as there have been the most horrible errors respecting the person of the Mediator, so there has also been fearful confusion upon the gifts of the Spirit. In fact, it is at this point there pertains the most serious mistakes with regard to Him. Men have failed to distinguish between His extraordinary and His ordinary gifts, and have sought to generalize what was special and exceptional, urging the rank and file of professing Christians to seek power from on high and the baptism of the Spirit and the wild extravagancies have been fostered and the door has been opened wide for Satan to enter and delude the souls. Amen. That's some strong language, but that's truth. And what Brother Pink is essentially saying is that, is that we have placed something, not we, some have placed in this generation and past generations emphasis on seeking out the power of the Spirit and highlighting these apostolic sign and revelatory gifts which were given to the apostles at that stage of post-Pentecost emphasizing power that does not belong to them and that the Holy Spirit does not endow upon them. And I cannot help but think of Matthew 7, where he says and when those stand before God and they say have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name have we not cast out devils? In thy name have we not done many wondrous works? And what will Christ respond Response be to them. Depart from me, I never knew you. Because he wasn't in any of that. Consider that this error was even postulated in the Old Testament when men pretended to be endowed with the gift of prophecy in that day, when only God's specific prophets were called to that office. 1 Kings 22, 6 through 7 is an example, as well as Jeremiah 5 31. Now, with all of that said, and again, I said that I wasn't going to re-preach what I preached last Sunday night. I'm not going to. But we would dare not, in an effort to combat the false doctrines of misled souls, negate the truth that the Holy Spirit does call individuals into special and specific service, and does equip them with the necessary gifts in order to accomplish that service. Now, we left off last week, if you recall, by introducing the last point of our message, which shall be the sum of this one. And that is, the Holy Spirit is who sanctifies the believer, whose holiness enables the believer, who moves the believer to worship, empowers the believer, and makes the believer fruitful. That is 
the role and the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian. And it is upon this truth that we desire to elaborate and find within it the truth concerning the types of gifts that the Spirit does bestow upon His people. Now, before we delve into the nature of the Spirit's gifts, we need to be quickly reminded of two things. Number one, we need to be reminded, before we look at these gifts, what they are and what they are not, we need to understand, first of all, the purpose of the believer and God bringing him to salvation. The purpose of the believer and God bringing him to salvation. Ephesians 2.10 states that we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which, he hath, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in. Them. Now, I've mentioned this before, and this is important that you remember about that word workmanship. That comes from the Greek poetia. Poetia is also a, deriva a derivation from the word poema in our New Testament, and that is where we get our English word poet or poetry. And so that word workmanship means poetry. Be not a hearer of the word only, but also a doer of the word. That word doer of the word also comes from that Greek word poetia which means poetry. And so when we are to be a doer of the Word, we are to be an expression of the Word. It is our poetry. And again, I know I've used this example, but for those of you who have never heard it, a poet or a songwriter, someone who writes poetry, typ typically writes from the heart. It's an expression of who they are. That's why there are various sorts of poetry that I just frankly can't understand. Because it's an expression of their inner being. It's an expression of who they are outside. And when we consider that we are His, we are God's poetry, that we are His poem that He is writing now, that He is constructing, that He is putting together, we are to be an expression of who He is. That kind of sheds new light on what that word workmanship emphasizes, that God is working out in you an expression of Himself. What a wonderful thought that is. And if we are to be a doer of the Word, that means that the Word should so inundate the believer that in everything we do, we are expressing the Word of God. And so when we understand that the purpose of the believer is that we are the workmanship of God, that you are the expression of God, it lends to you an understanding of your purpose in life. It lends to you an understanding of why God has redeemed you in the first place. So very quickly, first and foremost, we must, must never forget that God does not bring anyone unto Himself to redeem them, to ransom them, to justify, sanctify, and glorify them without the express reason being to glorify Himself through them. Amen. This is why any and all are saved. And let no one ever undermine this truth or ever think anything less of it. You are saved to glorify or for the glory of God Almighty. You say, well, God saved me because He loved me. Well, that is absolutely unequivocally correct. Yes, He did save you because He loves you. But in loving you, what is He revealing? He's revealing His grace and mercy, which reveals His glory. And as completely depraved individuals, we are utterly unlovable. We have the nature of Adam's rebellion in us, and by that nature we are enemies of God. That's why you don't understand His love until you understand, and I, I fully still don't fully understand His love. But you can't understand even, even a, a, a small amount of it until you understand just who you are as an individual. Amen. The Bible says in Romans 8, 7 through 8, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And that word enmity, it's important that we understand that. That word means hostility. He's not just speaking, and in the preceding verses he talks about such were some of you. He's not, he's not speaking of just the, the worst of the worst. He's speaking of the carnal mind, which is the mind that every individual is born with. And that is the sin nature that man is born with that is at enmity with God. That means it's hostile toward God. Say, so, well, I've never overtly said I hate God. Well, if you've walked in the flesh, that nature is at enmity with God. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5, But God, who is rich in mercy for His great love, wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved. Understanding the inherent sin nature of man is necessary in understanding God's love to His sheep. 
It is a love founded in grace and experienced by His mercy. And the fact that we are that unworthy to be loved, and that by nature we are haters of God, reveals the glory of God. Amen. As well, He allows others to perish, revealing His glory. Did you know that allowing others to pay, perish, allowing man to pay his own debt for sin, reveals the glory of God? How so, preacher? Well, it does so in, in reminding us and revealing that God is just. God is a just God. He is a holy God. He is a consuming fire. Amen. We are called and made believers by the regenerate power of the Holy Ghost through no will or work of our own, through no plan or power outside of God's purpose and work. And this truth concerning the nature of God's sovereign purpose to from the foundation of the world, set apart a people unto Himself, send His Son in time to complete the work of atonement, and in time bring all of His lost sheep unto Himself, only He and He alone receives the glory for it. When you understand God's sovereign design for salvation and understand your total inability, you understand that God alone receives all of the glory. And that's a powerful truth concerning the nature of salvation. And, that, and the reason is, is to conform each individual to the image of His Holy Son. But secondly, in glorifying Himself, He conforms His children to His will. The reason we start at this point is to emphasize to you that whether you live or die, whether you work or sleep, whether you marry or do not marry, whether you walk hither or thither, whatever you do or do not do, you are meant to bring glory to God on this earth and in eternity. Now, therefore, whatever God enables you to do, whatever gift that we will mention here shortly, He provides you that's meant for His glory. What He does not provide you is also meant for His glory. And it just simply further illuminates us to us the truth that we are clay in the hands of the Master. And that his will is to do is for that his will for us is to do his will in the lives of his people. His will is to conform individuals for specific purposes, place them in certain places, endow them with certain gifts and abilities to ultimately work out in time his purpose and plan for the ages. And when you consider that the timeline of mankind that for these last 6,000 years, and only God knows how, how many more thousand years, or thousand days, or fewer than that, that lie ahead of us. When you know that He has called you, and, sa and saved you, and sanctified you, and, 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 and provided you, listen, He's placed you at Southside Baptist Church in Winter Haven, Florida, for a specific purpose, for a specific reason. When you wrap your mind around that as much as possible, you understand that this is all about His glory being accomplished. What He has blessed me with, what He has not blessed me with, is all about Him. This is what you are. You are a vessel of the Lord, fitted for His service to do His will and pleasure. And as God's children, we seek for God to reveal and lead us in His will and not our own. So this is your purpose, to recognize that you are clay to be molded in whatever form or fashion God desires. And this truth, is convey, this truth conveyed is part of the realization of God's purpose and present sanctification. This is what sanctification is about. Sanctification is the facet of salvation that separates the individual and consecrates them unto the Lord. This is accomplished by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's why sanctification is ascribed to the Holy Spirit. In fact, that word sanctify in the New Testament means to render or to acknowledge, to be venerable, to hallow, to separate from things profane, and to dedicate to God, to consecrate, to purify. Amen. And let me say this, just so we're perfectly clear concerning the matter of sanctification and who does the work. God sanctifies by virtue of the Holy Spirit. We are made holy unto Him by the presence of the Spirit. It's not something that we accomplish. It's not something that we strive to earn. Sanctification, let me say this, this is often misunderstood. Sanctification is not, I repeat, is not an improvement of the flesh. Although it does include the bodies, 1 Corinthians, Thessalonians 5.23 says, it does not change the sinfulness of the flesh. Many misunderstand sanctification, to believe that we may be perfect in the flesh. That's not what sanctification is. 
I like what one writer said. He said, The body is included and in that the soul is, by means of sanctification, given greater control over it. And thus it is kept back to some extent from overt acts of sin. But it's, that is the flesh's, essential sinfulness is undiminished. Friends, we are holy because He is holy. Amen. Sanctification is a developing conservation and strengthening of the soul in His holiness. It is the Holy Spirit's work to conform us to the image of Christ and direct us to God's will and plan for us. So that's why the Holy Spirit is very important for you in this sanctification process. We need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We need to walk in the Spirit. We need to listen to the Holy Spirit. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to direct our prayers, to direct our thoughts, to direct our actions, to direct our words. To illuminate Scripture. The Holy Spirit is the agent in sanctification and that He leads us. Romans 8.14 For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. May I also say that God is not divided. The Holy Spirit will always lead in accordance and in complete harmony with the direct words of God and the principles found in it. Many times Christians use, well, the Spirit led me as a go-to for their disobedience because the preacher can't argue with that, right? Well, it's the Spirit just lead me. Well, is it in line with the Word of God? Is it in line with the principles of the Word of God? Let's, let's, because I, you know, as a young man, I used to, I used to use that. I'm very familiar with that. But be careful not to blame personal and carnal decisions upon the Spirit of God. That's why oftentimes I'll say, I'm, I'm even careful to say, well, the Lord laid this upon my heart. And I'm not saying if you say that you're wrong. There are times that I do say that. But let me say, when I say that, it's after much prayer and consideration. Because I know, as David said, the naughtiness of my own heart. I know my own presumption. I know I have a will, and I have a very strong will. I know I have desires, and I know that even when I'm thinking it's the right thing, it may not necessarily be the Spirit's prodding or leading. We need to be careful about those things. Because ultimately what you're doing is you're speaking in the name of God's Spirit. You're attributing a certain work to God's Spirit. Remember what we talked about last week when these men and women get in the flesh and they, they gyrate and they convulse and they vomit and they uncontrollably laugh and speak in a gibberish tongue and then ascribe that to the work of the Holy Spirit of God who does not operate in men so. And to ascribe that to the Holy Spirit of God is to put God's name on it, His stamp of approval on it. We need to be very careful with that. Amen. Just be very careful with that. We need to have more reverence for the Holy Spirit. We don't like that men would use the Lord's name in vain, right? But the Holy Spirit enables us. Ephesians 3.16, that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. The Lord enables us. You've heard the saying, the Lord won't, won't uh, uh, well, I don't even remember the saying. The Lord won't call you where He doesn't equip you, something to that degree. But it's a biblical principle. The Lord enables us. The Holy Spirit makes us fruitful. Galatians 5, 22-23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. I read it quickly because it seems like I quote that Scripture about every sermon. But it's a truth. Amen. And it's necessary. Because that's what the fruit of the Spirit is in your life. And it's His fruit, not yours. Amen. And I believe it necessary to be reminded of this work of the Spirit in order to more readily understand the gifts that His people are now afforded. So understand what your purpose is. In very many words, I could sum it up by saying this. Your purpose, your salvation is for simply the glory of God. To do what He wants you to do. And to trust that He will equip you to do what He wants you to do. As Brother Max spoke this morning about those who would forsake all to follow Christ. They knew that this was the King of the universe walking. And so it didn't matter to them what they had or what they did not have. It didn't matter to them that, that they didn't have maybe a, 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 a wallet full of money or, or a plan going forward. Which is what we tend to do, right? It didn't matter to them. It was Christ. He's called. I'll go. 
and trust that if Christ is called, He'll enable you and equip you by virtue of His Holy Spirit. So the purpose of the Christian. Now let's look number two. This is all introduction, by the way. The purpose of the church and the ministry of God's people. We need to understand, before we look at the... Don't smile, Brother Tim. I'll be done in time. He's like, what? <laughs> I know you better than that, brother. In order to understand the nature and the bestowal of gifts and how we're to use them, we need to first understand our purpose as believers. And then understand we need to know the purpose of the church and the ministry of the God's people. And upon understanding the purpose of the individual believer to bring glory to God through our lives and confirmation of His purpose and plan, then we naturally progress to the truth that Christ established His local church to function as the channel of His ministry through which He receives glory. The church, of course, is made up of believers in Christ, those in the family of God, those who are called to congregate together in worship of Christ and to carry out the ordinances and commission He Himself gave us. In a nutshell, that's the church. Paul concludes the third chapter of his epistle to the Ephesians upon encouraging them in the grace and the glory of God with verse 21 where he says unto him, Be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Gill writes this concerning that passage. He says the place where this glory is to be given is the church. For the church and true believers only know the blessings and the mysteries of the divine grace. And they only know how to glorify God aright. And besides, glory must be given to God by believers not only separately and apart, Heart, but conjunctly and together in a church state, because there the Lord appears glorious, grants His presence, and displays His mighty grace. The Lord's local church is an important institution through which we worship God and carry out collectively His commission. You say, well, I am the church. That's absolutely correct. You are the church, but we understand that we, He calls us, He assembles us as ecclesia, a calling together to congregate to collectively worship and to collectively get on the same page concerning the ministry that we need to be engaged in. And He gets glory in that. Why? Because He gets glory that His people, where there is neither Jew nor Gentile or, or Greek nor Scythian of, of all walks and manners of life who have been redeemed, who have been called out of darkness into marvelous light, can join together and have common ground in the unity of Christ Jesus and work together for the glory of God. Yeah, That's where He gets glory. Amen. Yes, you can glorify God individually. I would never say that you can't. You should. You must. But there's a special premium on this institution. And as believers in Christ, we're called out of this world and we're joined to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And again, we're no more separated. Although from many nations and kindreds and tongues, we're brought into one sheepfold. But... God has also called His people to unite together for the common work of the Lord in particular places for the carrying out of His work. This is the manifestation of the kingdom, the Lord's New Testament church. It is His visible assembly of the saints. In the Lord's local churches, He has placed members with gifts for the edification of that body. We read that there in Ephesians chapter 4. Every, unto every one of us, verse number 7, is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And then he says in verse number 12, for the perfecting of the saints. Now specifically speak of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, but it's all for the perfecting of the saints, for the working of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Our personal ministry is in and through and unto the Lord in His church. Amen. And you particularly in this church. Consider that God's Spirit has placed you in this specific body for a reason. We do, we do not church shop. How many times have you heard that? Well, I'm just shopping for a church. We heard that not too long ago, didn't we? I think during the hurricane. You hear it all the time? Well, I'm shopping for a church. Well, where's God leading you? Ask God where He wants you to be. And God doesn't just allow His children, if they're in a scriptural church, to just flounder around. I can't say that completely and unequivocally. Sometimes He needs to, lead, to teach us lessons. God is sovereign after all. But we do know that we are called to assemble ourselves together. We are called to seek His will. We are a functioning body. We are not only a place to go here preaching. We are all to be a part of this church. 
And many misunderstand the nature of the church to the, to the degree that they believe it is just somewhere they go or something they do. That is not what church is. Look over at Romans chapter 12. Verse number 3, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Now, all Christians have a purpose. I'm not necessarily relegating this to, to one assembly, but I will say this, that God fits us and frames us together, and it is certainly the expression of this truth carried out through His local assembly. Assembly. We are one body in Christ, and every one member is one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. So let's use this as a text to emphasize the bestowal, number three, of spiritual gifts. And, and I believe that from this text in Romans 12 and from Ephesians 4, um, we're going to examine these gifts of the Spirit that are, I believe, necessary for the work of the body of Christ. And we're going to begin this point by stating because what we have thus far seen and that the believer is called by the Holy Spirit unto salvation, he is indwelled by the Holy Spirit because of the nature of sanctification, that no one may truly say that they are bereft of spiritual ability in the service of God because of who you are. You are called, you are sanctified, the Lord has, has indwelled within you by virtue of His Holy Spirit, so no one can ever say that you have no spiritual ability within you. That is to say that you don't have the Spirit of God who can do all things. Right? So let's never get down on ourselves and say, well, I don't have any spiritual ability. I can't do anything in the service of God. Now, wait a minute. Do you have God's Spirit within you? Listen, I, last I read, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Last I, I read that the Spirit of God is the all-powerful, omnipotent, glorified God of heaven who personally has invested Himself within this being to do a work because I'm called for Him to be His workmanship. So we all have a spiritual ability within us to do the work God has called us to do. Now interestingly, when reproving a church, Paul acknowledged their misuse and overemphasis of the extraordinary gifts of tongues, right? Remember in 1 Corinthians 12? Paul knew the gift was temporal and not conducive to the perp perpetuity of the New Testament church. We may see in 1 Corinthians 13, we may highlight this matter. Remember, if, if I have the gift of prophecy, if I speak in all tongues, and I have not charity, I have nothing. I am a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. So in, in reproving a church, the church at Corinth, he highlights their misuse of these apostolic gifts. Yet when encouraging the church, Paul emphasized the usage of just the ordinary and common gifts that were needful for the edification and the functionality of the New Testament church. When he encourages the, those at, 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 the, in Romans, when he encourages the church at Ephesus, he doesn't say, well, hey, listen, get, go hire, get some more apostles, get some more people in there, because you're not healing enough people. You're not growing enough legs out. You're not in there speaking in enough tongues. When he, when he emphasizes the fruit of the Spirit, he's not saying, oh, well, now hold on a minute. When's the last time uh, there was a miracle? When's the last time you raised somebody from the dead? No, what he highlights is the common, ordinary gifts that God bestows upon common, ordinary sinners when He indwells within them and becomes their, their God and them His people. Amen. And these are the things highlighted and these are the things emphasized. And when dealing with the specifics of what we would classify as the quote-unquote ordinary gifts of the Spirit, it's important that we understand that any and all talent and capacity for knowledge is a gift of God to accomplish His will in the earth. Let me say that again, because I'm about to say something that you... I'm, I'm going to quote something, and I'm going to explain what this person means. Let me say I agree fully with him, that at first you may not catch... 
Any and all talent and capacity for knowledge is a gift from God to accomplish His will on earth. Any and all knowledge. Calvin in his Institutes of Christian Religion wrote this. He said, we should never forget that all gifts, even speaking of the lost, are given by God's Spirit who distributes them as He pleases for the common good of humankind. When someone should ask what dealings God's Spirit could have with the wicked who are totally alienated from God, I would answer that their reasoning is flawed. When Scripture says that the Spirit dwells only in believers, it is the Spirit of sanctification that is meant, who consecrates us to God to be His temples. All the while, however, God does not fail to move by the power of that Spirit all creatures according to the nature with which He endowed each of them at creation. Let me read that final portion again. All the while, however, God does not fail to move by the power of that Spirit all creatures according to the nature with which He ha has endowed each of them at creation. The, the point the writer is essentially making, which is agreeable with my own belief, is that God has made both the vessels of wrath and honor for purpose. And that He endows both types of vessels with gifts and talents to carry out His will. Consider the atheist physician who by his knowledge of medicine in the human body has saved countless lives. Consider the mortician. I've used this example before. Morticians prove that God is sovereign. Morticians prove that God is sovereign. Because a mortician is raised up, God sovereignly raises up and puts in his heart to care for the bodies of the deceased. Because the world needs them. Friends, if we assert that God is sovereign over all, that means that His Spirit even moves in the lost to accomplish His will. And whatever knowledge or gift or talent they have to work for the functionality of society, they must attribute it to God. Whatever knowledge, how often do we pray, for instance, uh, for, for Landon? Let's use him as, a, as an example. How often do we pray, Lord, would you give wisdom to the doctors in determining this? Would you move them to understand what this is? Beloved, understand the Holy Spirit of God is omnipresent everywhere. And the Holy Spirit of God has moved men and He's, he's, he's brought up men through various events in their lives onto certain career paths in order to accomplish a grand purpose for the ages. Even through negative experiences, He raises up men. For this cause, He raised Pharaoh up. In Romans chapter 9, verse 17, For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. So even the genius physician, even uh, uh, he who found a vaccine for polio and, and uh, I don't know, a cure for all of these different diseases, God used them because God gave them the knowledge. There was no knowledge of these things in and of themselves. And when we understand that, you'll understand more the nature of the gifts that He provides believers. So with that stated, let us note that God has given certain gifts to all His children, and these gifts He has bestowed upon them equally. Three primary gifts, and we could probably go further than this. They can all be wrapped up by the final one. But number one, grace. Ephesians 4, 7, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Paul speaks of the common gift of God's saving grace that no one individual has more or less of. You say, well, you didn't know me when I was a young one. I, was a, I raised Cain. It must have took a lot more grace for me. No, it didn't. No one individual has more grace than another, saving grace. God may be a little bit more tolerant for His purposes on some occasions. That's up to Him. Any who are redeemed are redeemed so because of grace. As Gil writes, he says, which may refer to the saints in common and may be interpreted of justifying, pardoning, adopting, sanctifying, and preserving grace, bestowed upon them all, freely and liberally, not grudgingly, and without motive and condition in them, or to be ministers of the gospel, and so design gifts fitting for the ministry, which everyone has, though differing one from another, and all of free grace. If you are saved here today, you've been given a gift of the Spirit, and that gift is grace. Secondly, faith. 
Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. While indeed we may say that some have a greater degree of faith than others, saving faith is granted to every believer without exception. No one is converted without this gift. So if you are a believer today, you've been given this gift of faith. You are probably coming in here thinking, all right, the preacher's going to tell me what my spiritual gift is. Well, here it is. You've been given God's grace. You've been given faith to believe. And you've been given salvation. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again on their repentance, seeing they crucified in themselves the Son of God afresh, and put Him to open shame. Let me say this, no one individual in the body of Christ is more saved than another. No one person is more saved to another. These three gifts God gives to each of His children, liberally and equally. So we must understand by virtue of our discussion of spiritual gifts that every believer is gifted by God. However, God has even beyond that placed within His servants special gifts that are useful for the operation of the church. And again, as we saw in Ephesians 4, as we see in Romans 12, these gifts are for the glory of God and the operation of His church. And just as we may say that even in the secular world, all men may be granted the gift of life, yet not all are given equal gifts in that life. Therefore, by what we see in our text, not all gifts are equal in the church. Verse number 6, he says, "...having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us." G gifts differing. In fact, they must not all be the same for the functionality of the church. <laughs> right? If we were all alpha males, we wouldn't go very far. If we all had the same gifts, talents, abilities, we wouldn't go very far. Remember the home. We talked about equality in the home. We talked about what that word equal means and how I said to the, to the gasp of many that men and women are not equal. But in this regard, I do not mean superior and inferior. By this I mean that their roles are different. Their roles are different. One is the weaker vessel. One is the stronger vessel. One may be weaker in some areas. One may be stronger in some areas. That's what makes the man and the woman compatible, right? If they were exactly alike, they would not be compatible. And the success of the Lord's church hinges upon, number one, the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit does the work in individuals to make them compatible. Therefore, there's differing, differing gifts within the Lord's church. So we're going to take the remainder of our time, which is not long, and examine a few of the specific gifts or abilities that God grants and cultivates in the lives of individuals in the church. Paul begins this portion of his discourse. Notice verse number 2. No, that's not the verse I wanted. No, verse number 3 is what I wanted. Verse number 3. He, say, for I, he says, For I say through, though the gra through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. He notes that no matter what special gift or office God has given to the individual, no one is to be exalted by thinking they are better than another. He states what he does in order to stifle any such notion that one is better than the other. So number one, we see in the church, we see the special gift of prophecy. Verse number six, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portion of faith. Now, this gift is not in reference to Old Testament or apostolic foretelling. There's a difference here. That word prophesy can emphasize two things. That word prophesy can mean that it's looking to the future and God giving a specific message that's not been revealed before 
before and revealing the Word of God. But in the New Testament, in the, in the, in the New Testament church, that word prophecy is giving, it is the proclamation of the gospel. I'm prophesying to you right now because I am articulating the, the, the words of Jesus Christ. I am bringing to you the message of God. And how you can affirm that that's the message of God is to know that it's not a new revelation, but it is firm and founded in what God has revealed to His people. And so I'm prophesying to you right now. This gift is closely linked with ministering and signifies the work of an elder in the church. By prophesying is meant... Not foretelling things to come, but preaching the gospel. And this is also, by the way, the sense of the word that is used in many places of Scripture, including 1 Corinthians 13, 2, when Paul says, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. So we can expound to you the Word of God all day long. You can get a nice articulate orator behind the pulpit every Sunday. If he has not charity, if he has no love, if he has no compassion, if there's no meaning behind it, then he's a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. This gift speaks of the Spirit-given gift of opening and explaining the Scriptures. God has said in His churches those with the ability to explain and sound forth the Word of God. Specifically, God endows His pastors and elders with this ability. And God raises men up for this position. And, the, and, and those who are raised up for this position also have qualifications as well. 1 Timothy 3, 1-7, this is a true saying, If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, not given to, hospital or pardon me, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, nor no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. God raises up special men, endows them with a special ability. And it is a gift of God. Amen. Listen, when we start putting our confidence and our flesh and our ability and our understanding and our intellect to articulate forth and sound forth the words of God, we have failed as preachers. We have failed in this office. These are gifts that God has given. And in verse number 7, or ministry. Let us wait on our ministering. Now that word ministry is interesting. That is the word diakonia, which is a form of the word diakonio, uh, from which we get the word deacon. This word sometimes signifies the whole ecclesiastical ministry, which includes all who are placed in the local assembly. But here, deaconship, or the office of deaconship, being a distinct office from preaching the word, is understood. Gill writes, he says, for such who are appointed to this office are chosen not only to a place of honor, but of service and business, which they should behave with prudent sobriety and humility. Now, while all of us are to serve one another, while all of us are to engage in ministry, God raises up, equips, and implants within some specific characteristics and abilities to facilitate this needful office of the church. And of course, 1 Timothy goes on to list the qualifications of a deacon. Not everyone is called or given the spiritual ability to be a deacon. There's the gift of teaching. I'm, I'm going to hurry up here. I, I could elaborate on these two a little bit more, and I've got the notes to do it, but I, I'm not going to do that. I'll, although I will say, verse number 7, that we can all evangelize by proclaiming the gospel. That's not meant here. Rather, it's in regard to the station of teacher in the Lord's church who can explain Scripture and exhort others by doing so in a way that they may learn and be discipled. God raises and gives spe special gifts to teachers. There's the gift of exhortation in verse number 8 that speaks of these things. And then there's some other things there as well. But I, I, I will say this, however, though. I believe that a pastor will include all of these. A pastor will include all of these, even down to exhortation, which is comforting, encouraging, being patient with people. And we see that articulated 1 Timothy 4.2, 2 Timothy 4.5, John 21, 15 through 17. But these are gifts of the Spirit. Let me say, some, some have a knack of just trusting God. 
Some have an ability to just not let any, uh, any of the weights of the world and be that encouragement to others who are struggling. Some have a knack of just comforting and visiting and guiding and, and being there for one another. God has placed upon heart, and you think, you think about the sovereignty of God. You think about everything that God has allowed you to go through in life. Every stumble you've taken, every turn you've taken, that at the time may have seemed like it was a very disastrous thing in your life. Maybe it was a time of loss, it was a time of trial, it was a time of testing. It was perhaps a time of sin that you lived in. But God used it and He orchestrated your life and He set you upon a path, enabled you or allowed you to experience things in order to bring you to a place of ministry. And He's endowed with you the, the gifts that you can be a minister to others and that you can walk with others and that you can work with others. Oh, that's a gift of God. To where you can look back on your life and you can say, well, I, well, many of us could look back and we can see all kinds of regret. And, man, I wish I would have done that. Well, you look, you never wish you would have sinned. But understand that God was in all of that, bringing you to a specific place that He could per, be, in, bestow within you a gift. For the functionality of Southside Baptist Church, we are many members, but we're fitted together for a reason. He's brought us here for a reason, to minister together for a reason. So the next time you get irritated with the personality of Myron, remember that God's placed him here for a reason. Amen. Remember that somebody needs Myron. Remember that somebody needs the personality of Keith Mosley and Carrie, Katie, and Joel Connor and Ralph. <laughs> We need each other. Well, God's placed us here. Let's not take that for granted. You know, sometimes personalities clash and there can be conflicts. You know, when that happens, we just need to humble ourselves and realize that, hey, God's got them here for a reason. Maybe God's using them in the life of another. Things that you don't know and understand are going on in the lives of people. But God has endowed us with gifts. Rosalind Cornelison may be a more patient person than Jared Bennett. Jared Bennett may be more, amen, he said that. Jared Bennett may be a more compassionate person than Pat Eddins, although I don't know. But God has placed us all here together amen. and given us these common gifts. If God so works in the functionality of society to make sure that there's plenty of morticians for Winter Haven, Florida, Polk County, Florida. Otherwise, we'd be up to here in cadavers, right? You don't think God's at work there? What about a pediatrician? Who has to have a heart and a mind to deal with children and look in the eyes of a child who's perishing because of leukemia. And has to do that every day, day in and day out. Or an EMT who has to go to scenes of car accidents and house fires where they have to see things that you and I would never want to see. God placed that upon their heart. God gave them that gift because society needs it. Society needs doctors and lawyers and Indian chiefs. It needs it all. And this church needs every one of her members. Amen. And God has given you a gift. That's the gift you need to be searching for. That's the gift you need to be desirous of. That's the gift you need to allow the Lord to show me. Don't look for some power. Don't look for some extraordinary thing that's not going to happen. Be thankful for those ordinary things God gives you. Yes, He set some apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists. But I'll tell you what, this pastor needs these people and the gifts that God's given you as much as you need him. And I'll tell you that for a fact. And any of you who've been in the ministry and had to deal with the challenges of ministry, you know that firsthand. We've got some pastor's wives here. You know what those challenges are. You know what those difficulties are. So let me encourage you. Don't ever think that you have nothing to offer. We can get all pious and say, well, brother, you know, there's none good, no, not one. I ain't nothing. Well, you know, that may be true in the sense of salvation. But, but, but to look at yourself and say that I have no spiritual ability, you are negating the power of God within you. Because it's really not about you. It's not about you mustering something up. It's not about you showing some great display or, or having the spotlight or bragging on social media about all the things you do. 
It's about ministering to one another, submitting to one another, serving one another, and exercising within you, externally, that gift within you that God placed there, and being satisfied in that. Are you satisfied with that? So we conclude our discussion by finally noting that any gift that is given is meant to be used for the glory of God. Of these gifts, one wise man said, All these gifts are not the effects of nature, the fruits of human power, diligence, and industry, but they flow from the grace of God, who dispenses them when, where, and to whom He pleases in a free and sovereign manner, and therefore to be acknowledged as such, and to be used in His glory, and for the good of His church and people. I am astounded that my children can sit at a piano, and I know for some of you, maybe Laura Faye, Myron, my wife, may not be a big deal, but I'm astounded that I can hum a song or tell them, hey, you know this song, and they can sit at a piano and within five, now they may not have all the chords and stuff, in fact, I don't even know what a chord is, I mean, it's a, it's a line that you pluck. But they can pick out the tune, and then within a matter of five minutes, they can hammer away at that tune. Well, that's no big deal. Eva Trulock, I, I missed her, of course. I'm astounded at that, because I'm, I, I, I can't do that. And I have tried to do that. I can't do Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Listen, God has given that gift. Not everybody can do that. Maybe there's something that you can do that God's given you. What are you to do that with that? Well, I'm reminded of a verse I've got written in here somewhere of Colossians 3, 23 through 24. Appeal to this, chat, appeal to this passage and I'm done. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. If God has given you an ability, if the Spirit has gifted you, do it hardly as unto the Lord. Amen. Hardly as unto the Lord, because He's got a purpose for it. There's a whole lot more that we could say. Perhaps there's, there's a lot that I wanted to say uh, doctrinally that, that maybe I'll get to next week, okay? Um, but I wanted to wrap up the uh, series here on spiritual gifts. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank You so much.